number that went down to the place where the outdoor concert was that was attacked and they planted trees in that field. That's, am I not loud enough? I can take it I need to eat it. What? I can turn up over here. Eat it, eat it. I've got to be hungry. <laughs> I can anyway, they here. planted trees in an area of desolation. That's how That's Israel better. brings beauty out of, out of okay. what isn't. And God brings beauty out of everything. So whether you feel gifted or not, make your joyful noise unto the Lord. Let him hear. Let Feel his joy. He's not looking for perfection. He knows we'll never be perfected on this side of heaven. Yeah. So right. and I can say that for sure. <laughs> And I'm hoping somebody gets back in here because he's going to miss my beginning and it's, it's even pointed for him, but I'm going to go ahead and start. 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says, But now faith, hope, and love remain. These three, but the greatest of these is love. And that's what I've titled my message tonight. The greatest of these is love. What a gift. But let's look at those three. We've got what is faith, what is hope, what is love. Faith, I know, comes against fear and doubt, and there's a day coming when we won't need faith. We won't be living in fear and doubt. So, okay, that's faith. And hope, hope's the assurance of things not seen. One day it won't be hope anymore because it will be seen. So, okay, I can set that aside. Mm -hmm. But what about love? What about love? And before you think, okay, well, where is she going? She's in the Brit Hadashah, she's talking about love, and what happened to the judgments? <laughs> Let me take you back there. Before I say more about that, let's talk about our parsha, Mishpatim. Let's talk about the rules. Let's talk about the judgments. And it does begin in Shemot, in Exodus chapter 21 and verse 1. And Bruce read it. He brought it out. Now these are the judgments, ha mishpatim, that you shall set before them. The word that's used in the very beginning starts with the uh, Hebrew letter vav. It's the Allah. I'm sorry, the Aleh. I have to say it the right way, I hope. <laughs> but anyway, the vav is the first letter. That Vav changes it if I set it from the Hebrew, instead of saying, now these are the judgments, I would be saying, and these are. And even in our English, we know what and is. And is a conjunction. It connects to. That's what the Vav does also. It's a connector. So it's used to add to or to continue what's already being said in the previous text. It's going to link it together. And even uh, our, our revered rabbis brought that out. The Mishpatim don't stand alone. They're connected to what just came prior. And if you've been it reading in your, your scriptures, and even if you haven't, a lot of people know Shemot, Exodus 20, because we get from it the Ten Commandments. So now we're going to connect commandments with the judgments. We're going to see that it comes together. It's not meant to stand independent or alone. And the Mishpah team are actually going to elaborate on the commandments. And when you look at it from that view, it begins to give you a different insight and a different view. Just prior to this, we had our mountaintop experience. If you weren't with us, you missed it. God is entering in a covenant with his people. He's entering in a covenant with the people of Israel. And he is their holy God, but he's telling them that they'll be a holy people to represent him to the nations. See, he never left the nations out. It was his order. Now he's coming down on the top of Mount Sinai. He's called Moshe up, and that he's verbally communicated the Ten Commandments to Moshe and has Moshe bringing them to the people. That's where our backdrop is. This parasha has so much packed into it. It's called Sefer Habrit. Sefer is book. Okay, and Habrit, 
Brit, if you hear Brit Chadashah, you're hearing covenant. So it's the book of a covenant. And that's what it's called in chapter 24, verse 7. That's right where it comes from. That really, it makes us realize this was like a subset. It's even given a separate scroll that has all of this in it. Even though we're only talking about a few chapters, it's so packed elaborating on the terms of the covenant, on the terms of those Ten Commandments, that it's standing out and it's studied and looked on alone. We don't think about that. We hear about the Book of Esther, the Megillah. We hear about you know different ones, but this is also one. And this is so important to our Jewish people. It's such a guideline for them that later what's called the Beit Din, and that's the judgment. The, the house of judgment is the people who come together when you're standing before counsel for a decision to be made. This is the origin. This is where it started. It's based on these judgments. And it's passed down. So traditional Judaism will tell us that the view of Torah is a line of transmission from God to Moshe. That's where it starts. That's in the Torah. We know God gave it to Moshe, to Moses, on the mountain. But then it goes through the prophets. It goes from the prophets to the men of the great assembly. And that's the forerunner to what's called the Sanhedrin in Yeshua's time. The, the men who would sit in judgment. It keeps going down through them to the Talmudic rabbis. The rabbis that are studying the Talmud, the commentaries. It goes into the Talmudic literature, which really is written down oral law. Somebody took the time to say, these are our oral traditions. These are our oral laws, and we better get them in writing so they don't get lost. So it comes all the way down. And by the time you get to 21st century here, it's even come through several times where it's in the medieval times, it was coded, and the responses that were given. So you have a rabbi, Maimonides, you have others like him who are highly revered, highly respected, and they, they codified it. They, this is the way, this is what has been said. And they're taking it all the way back, but it's passed through all of those lines, all of those hands and all of those people. So that, yes, ma'am. And what year? I mean, think about what year Maimonides had. That's right 1300s. Um, huh? or 1300s, or was it 1200? Before that, because Rashi was before that. Yes, and Rashi's another one. And Rambam, Rambam is Maimonides, yes, yes. They're um, 1100, I can't century. remember the dates. Yeah, yeah. And he's revered so much because he really took it and brought it into a modern setting so that they could understand. Like when the scriptures tell us that we can't light a fire on the Shabbat, is using your stove lighting a fire. He, they, they, he's the one to help them know and understand those kind of things. But the Jewish way of thinking is that the Torah is not just the writings. It's not just what we have in those first five books and the rest of the, the original covenant. That Well, actually, that's the Tanakh. So if I just stick with the five for the Torah, that's what Moshe preserved in those scrolls, but it's also this collective consensus of Jewish rabbinic law and customs and traditions over the centuries, and it's passed down so that we can be obedient to what God was saying. Their intent and their purpose is good. Now, does it stay there? We'll talk about that. <laughs> the very concept, though, of the mishpatim, of the judgments, right in the scriptures it tells us that god expects us to make wise decisions based on truth if you don't start on the right basis you're in trouble already so you've got to start on the truth proverbs 31 9 says open your mouth judge righteously defend the rights of the poor and the needy and i would ask you who needs their rights defended more than the poor and the needy. They're the ones that don't get a voice and don't get heard. And as we see the scriptures move on and go into the Brit Hadashah from the original into the new, we read in Yochanan in John chapter 7 and verse 24, do not judge by the outward appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. In 2 Timothy, when Paul Paul's writing to Jewish Timothy, chapter 2 and verse 15, he tells them rightly divide. And if you get into the, the, uh, the original language, it's cut it straight. You know, don't get off. Cut it straight. You know, something about cutting the mustard. Get it? 
Right. <laughs> measure twice, twice, cut once. There you go. Measure twice and cut once. And this parsha deals with the judgments. Okay. It deals with so many laws. It deals regarding slavery, indebtedness, capital punishment, the eye for the eye, the property rights, the restitution, not wronging strangers. That's the Gentiles. It has the Shemitah laws, the laws for the land, for the rest that they're supposed to have. And all of this, they get all of these judgment after judgment after judgment. And then it's all going to be confirmed with a sacrifice and with the sprinkling of blood. And I'll come back to that. But let me just bring you back. Remember, we're looking at Vav. We're looking at the connector. We're connecting the laws and how to live them out. And I think a lot of times people get confused with what is the law. They think, okay, it's just those Ten Commandments. And then someone comes along and says, well, wait a minute, there's 613 commandments in the Scriptures. And then someone else comes along and says, and here's how to do number 54, and here's how to do number 37. And there's so much there. But when we look at it from the Scripture, we can take the law, the Mosaic Covenant that God was making with His people, who are to be a holy nation and represent him, and we can divide it into three categories. We have the commandments. Those commandments express the righteous will of God, and nobody can argue with that. If you look at those ten, that's the righteous will of God. Then we have the judgments, like what we're talking about tonight, and that governs a lot of the, well, I shouldn't say a lot, it governs the social life of Israel, how to live out socially and, and accurately according to God's law. And then we have the ordinances. And the ordinances are governing the religious life of Israel. So when we look at the law, when you see that there's categories and you see all of these elements, all of that goes up into making what we call the law. The commandments that were given were really a ministry of condemnation and a ministry of death because no one can keep the law. And we read uh, this in the Brit Hadasha also as well as the original, and that's why the ordinances had to be given. Because the ordinances are where the high priests came in to their role, where the sacrificial system is given to us to cover the sin. God knew they were not going to be able to keep the law. He didn't give the law expecting them to keep it. That wasn't his point. See if you can figure out his point. But he, knowing that, gave the anticipation all the way back of the cross that would not be for thousands of years, but would be what everything was pointing toward. Everything focuses on that. Remember, we then looked at coming out of slavery, coming out of Egypt, and how we are to recall and remember, and how many times it's given to us, and so many different of our feasts and our remembrances all the way through. We saw that the central point of that was the Passover. It was the sacrificial lamb. That's the, the crux of it all. And when you know that, and then you have all of this surrounding it to help them understand it, know what to do and what to do because they don't do it. This is what they were entering into covenant with God with. And this is heavy. This is not light. They're getting a sentence put down on them how they're to live. And it wasn't easy. It wasn't, well, you just, you know, be a good person. You know, don't, don't be ornery to your neighbor. No, there was a lot more to keeping the covenants. In Dabarim, in Deuteronomy 27, verses 9 and 10, Moshe and the Levitical priests, the ordinances that had come out, the high priests, the Levitical priests, spoke to all of Israel, saying, Be silent and listen. Shema. <laughs> good point tonight, Bruce. Listen, Israel. This day you have become a people for the Lord your God. So you shall obey the Lord your God, do his commandments and his statutes, which I'm commanding you today. Now, that's what Moshe says it was recorded in Dabarim, but that's what's happening right now with our children of Israel and where we are. And after he gives them the Ten Commandments, before all these ordinances and statutes and all and the judgments, some of them have been given, but not by any means all of them, we get a whole litany of curses. 
There's actually 12 curses recorded in this few, in the few chapters, it's in one chapter if I remember correctly, for breaking the law. That they'll be cursed, cursed, cursed. One said it's like each tribe got their own curse. <laughs> but all of them were just a precursor to when we finally have our children of Israel come into the land, standing on Mount Aval and Mount Gerizim, and I brought a lesson out on that before, and you have all those curses being said and all those blessings being said, and they're, they're being told very clearly, obedience to God, blessing, 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 blessing. Disobedience, cursing, 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 there are consequences. When you know all of that and you realize, wow, that law, that's, that's heavy. That's something really they needed to take to heart. And they were supposed to be taking it to heart. And they were supposed to be saying, we're going to do it. Because they said, when Moshe brought it to them, they said, all that God says, we will do. Not just that they'd hear, but that they would do. They're coming at a heavy, heavy commitment. Why did God lay such a burden on the people when he knows they couldn't keep it. Couldn't somebody say, well, God, that's not very fair. <laughs> you know, I think of Thomas being told, well, you can't sing very good, but go ahead and give it a try. <laughs> but that's not our God, and that's never his purpose, and he never gave the law as a heavy burden. He says later to the Pharisaical people who were alive in the day when Yeshua walked on this earth, you lay the heavy burdens on the people. You add to the law. You make it complicated. You give them trouble. But what did you, what did Jehovah our God say about the law? And I'll take you to Tehillim. I'll take you to Psalm 19 and verse 7. And it says, the law of the Lord is perfect. We're all in agreement. It's perfect. But have you stopped and connected that phrase with the next one? The law of the Lord is perfect restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Okay, if this law kills, if this law brings the penalty of breaking the law, death, then how can you say that this is perfect, this is good, and this is restoring the soul? I think we've lost something there. And I really believe I respect my rabbis, I respect those who are wiser than I am, but I think they've missed the whole yeah. boat. They, they've missed the <coughs> whole thing. God didn't say pick and choose, mm -hmm. and that's one of the things I'll argue with Jewish people to this day who don't adhere to the word of God, who want to take parts and leave other parts out. I'll say, well, when did God ever say it's a cafeteria? When did he say, go through the line and choose what you like, choose what looks good, and don't worry about the rest. No, he tells us very clearly, it's all the way in the Brit HaDashah where it really spells it out, that if you break even one, you're guilty of breaking it all. That's recorded by Yaakov James in chapter 2 and verse 10, but Davarim, Moshe's words in chapter 27 and verse 26 also alludes to that, that breaking any of it brings guilt, that it, it all matters. It's all heavy when you're seeing it as, don't get out of line, don't get your big toe across the line, you know, watch everything you do. And again, I hear, but the Lord says, it's a restoring of the soul. Well, I think what we need to do is not take a verse out but look where it is, and how does it connect? And I don't have time tonight. I've done it before for us. My, Psalm 19 is one of my absolute favorite, although whatever I'm studying, I'll tell you is my favorite. <laughs> but it starts out, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. And right there, I've taken that and expanded on that. The heavens narrate, the heavens tell, the heavens are declaring the glory of God. And you go through the next verses all the way down to verse, through verse 6, before we get to 7, that, that is where it says the law of the Lord is perfect. And it talks about the heavens. It talks about how the voice comes out of the heavens in the day and even in the night. And I love when I get into the Hebrew, and I don't fully understand where I can say to you, this is how the Hebrew says it, but I'll take 
those who are smarter than me, <laughs> I'll take their word for it. They said it's as if the day is just gushing. It, 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 it wants to give out and is giving out and is de declaring and is narrating and is telling the glory of God. And it's got so much to tell that the night comes on and it's not ready to stop. So the night's got to pick up and it gushes out all night long. And we keep that cycle going. That's the first verse is that when you look at this psalm. And if you don't know, I brought out before that the, the stars tell the entire story of our Messiah from virgin birth through crucifixion, resurrection, and coming back ruling king. It's a fascinating study. This is what they're declaring. Whatever stars you're seeing now are part of that story. The stars you'll see three months from now are another part of the story, and it's a fascinating study. So we go through all of this. We're, we're looking at, at, at even the heavens have to shout it out. Yeshua himself looked at the rocks and said, if he didn't speak, the rocks would cry out. And we know all of nature is moaning to cry out. That's just waiting till it can fully express. And I think, wow, what was this world like before sin and the curse entered in? And here you've got all of these speaking, declaring, glorifying, speaking of the glory of God. And remember the glory of God, that's Yeshua. That's Yeshua. Hebrews tells us that the first chapter, the first few verses, that the radiance glory of God is Yeshua. It's more than a mirror image. It's an exacting. The mirror image isn't exacting, but it is. And, and so you know it's declaring Yeshua. And when I remember that, I've got my first clue where we're going. Because this sudden appearance of a disconnect this sudden idea that we've changed the subject, that all of a sudden we've gone from the heavens declaring to a law that's condemning. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. No, wait a minute and follow me because what we're really seeing is a transition from the heavenly glories of the material universe to the law of the Lord. Notice it's not the law of man. It's the law of the Lord. And when you begin to see that, Actually, Philo, and I do not like to study philosophy, so very rarely will you hear me tell you what one of the philosophers said, because to me, they're just, they get off, they, they miss God, and I want to stay on studying God. But even Philo caught it, and he said, you know, there's the combined idea here of the moral law with the cosmic law, the order of the heavens, the order for man. And he began to see there's a connection, a weaving here, and we are beginning to get an inkling because even Philo said that the idea of Torah is bringing it down to a natural law, but he was beginning to see something connecting to our God. There is a law that pervades the material universe. It constitutes its, its, its glory. Our scientists can look and say, Halley's Comet is coming and give you the date and where because of the orderliness of the universe. And we know that none of us wake up in the morning and get on our knees and pray, don't let gravity quit. Don't <laughs> let the, the earth quit spinning the way it is, the amount it is, the time it is, the distance from the sun. We take it for granted. We know that the sun's going to rise in the east and it's going to set in the west. We don't, even when we don't see it for a few days, we know it's there. <laughs> we know it's doing its thing. And that analogy of God's physical laws being so orderly and for a purpose, declaring his glory. Now let's take that into these moral laws and see, are they also declaring his glory? And are they showing an order and a beauty? And are they crying out, Yeshua? Yeshua, Yeshua, because that's the whole crux of it all. You know, that sacrifice, the Passover that I said was the crux, it's the sacrificial lamb. We know that's Yeshua. 
whether we're in Bereshit chapter 1, or whether we're in Revelation chapter 22, or whether we're anywhere in between. If you're not seeing Yeshua, you're not seeing it right. You're off. You're missing it. It is there. I don't care whether you're talking poetry, prophecy, laws, it, whatever. It's all the same message. And there's an orderliness, and there's a rhythm for it, there's a revelation that how could we expect God to fit into one little mold and one little way? He can't. He can't. So we've got to see him on these levels. It takes all of the heavens to begin to tell us what he's like. It takes all of earth to begin to tell us what he's like. And when we look at this and we begin to see that his laws were a role of life for his creation, for his creatures, he created us, then we see that there's something more that we're missing when we disconnect these two and say, that's talking about one thing and here's another subject. That we keep it together. And we see in our law the fact that salvation is not of the law in the sense the law cannot save. That's not the law's fault. That's man's fault because man can't live up to that law. There's nothing wrong with the law. It's what's wrong with man. But the law that God is giving, he's demanding a moral perfection. He's demanding an aspect that is holy, that's just, and that's good. And who does that make us think of? Are you beginning to see how everything is teaching us? about Yeshua. Everything's declaring it. The law is holy. The commandments are holy. They are just and good, and they are perfect, restoring the soul. Okay, how does that restore the soul? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I'll be glad to tell you. That word restoring, our Hebrew word shuv, repent, return, come back, is in that. And the word is being used to show that is to restore from disorder and decay. We see that even in Tehillim Psalm 80 and verse 19. We see the same word used in Ruth chapter 4 and verse 15, the book Ruth. And the restoration in that book was from sorrow and affliction. And we even see it's a restoration from death when we get into the first book of our kings in chapter 17, verses 21 and 22. They all use that word, shuv, shuv, and shuv, restore. So the conclusion that we should get is that the law is instructing, it's revealing, and it's restoring from moral blindness to the light. Oh, the light of the heavens, the sun, the moon, and the stars, they're all declaring. They're not just hanging out there to give us light, folks. They're for a purpose. Even Bruce said earlier, God's given us this calendar. We follow it because he said it's for times and seasons. It's for reasons, and we're beginning to see it here so that even this restores man from sin to righteousness because it says the testimony of the Lord is sure. The testimony, if you're giving your testimony, you're telling about yourself. You're telling what, who you are. And that's what the law is doing. That's what the heavens are doing. Now I see this song without it being broken up and jumping all over the place. And it's interesting that if you follow, and I hope you go home and read the song. If you follow from verse 8 on, when it refers to God, it uses the name Yehovah rather than El. El is the strong one. El is God's power and glory. And I'll say I see El all over heaven. But why did God choose to use the name Yehovah here? Because again, he's bringing the down to us. Because the name Yehovah is the covenant-keeping God. It's where God enters intimately into relationship with his creation to reveal himself to man. And now I get a whole new view of what the law is all about. It's expressing us who the Lord is. 
And in this, it makes even the 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 what it makes even the simple wise. I'm saying it backwards. And it doesn't mean simple in a putting down way, but it's saying you don't have to be a rocket scientist. You don't have to know how the heavens go. God didn't give us his word to tell us how the heavens go. He gave us his word to tell us how to go to heaven. <laughs> That's what matters. That's where it's at. So this is enlightening. This moral judgment is enlightening us. And now we see it, that he's coming in to instruct us. Oh, it, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Janet, but isn't that what Torah means? Instruction? We hear misspoken. Oh, Torah means law. No, it means instruction. It, I, and I love to take the word Bible, B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. <laughs> Way to go to heaven. So, the Torah, instructing. Now we've gone... Instead of looking at the law, rules, and condemnation, now we're beginning to see there is a positive tone here. It does restore the soul. It does bring us light because it's giving us positive instruction. It's not giving us negative, don't do this, thou shalt not, or off with your head. No. It, and, and even in the Brachad Hashad, Romans chapter 7, and Shaul Paul deals a lot with the law, explaining it to the Gentile people so they can begin to wrap their minds around it. And if you think that you can jump into the, the new without having the basis of the original, well, try going to high school without any education before, and that's about how good you'll do. Romans 7, 14, the law is holy and spiritual. The commandment, holy and just and good. Remember when we said the Lord is holy, just, and good? Now the commandment of the Lord is holy, just, and good. And suddenly we've gone from a very heavy parasha to a wow. Look what I'm learning about the Lord. And it doesn't stop there because that's my God. There's always more than one level. So we even see a hint of prophecy in here. We see that the law is a mirror of God's holiness because it's, a, it's showing us Yeshua. And remember the first verses of Psalm 19 are declaring the glory of God. They're declaring Yeshua. So as the psalmist moves on, we begin to realize that these commandments, these universal laws, they, they, they have a spiritual depth to them. Don't miss the depth. That's where the real meat is. That's where the, the wells, you know, they're deep. The waters are deep. The divine law, it is perfect. It is spotless. It is harmless. It's well-meaning. It's not meant to be a heavy burden and is all together to direct man into being restored, brought back from death, brought into newness of life, the quickening of the soul, and by this way now we can say that we've got divine law that gives us the divine way of salvation. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, you just hit it. Bingo. <laughs> you just got it. That's why God gave law. He gave it for a purpose. He didn't give it to burden, he gave it. And even told us in the scripture, it's to be a tutor. What's a tutor do? <laughs> no, let me come alongside and help you. Let me help you understand this. Let me show you what you're missing. And we know that I could say so much more about the tutor and the life of a child and a child that, that didn't have the freedom to be on his own but had this tutor go with him everywhere he went. Not to be the boss, but to keep him from harm. That's what God's doing here. To keep us from harm. And even worse, to keep us from the condemnation of death. He's speaking life into us. The heavens declared Messiah. They declared the glory of Messiah. And the law here is declaring the glory of Messiah. So it is going to warn when you're getting away and moving away from the glory. It is going to be intrusive if you're wanting to rebel and go your own way. But if you see it as a guide, a tutor, a help, a, a, 
you're going to see and embrace it. And again, we've suddenly gone from heaviness to, wow, I can appreciate this. And really, honestly, we all know a child really does not want to grow up with no laws, no rules. We know that, that, that children who, who have total freedom will say to a friend, when they see the friend being disciplined by their parent, I wish my parent cared that much. Well, God is our parent, and that's how much he cares. And he, he wants to bring us on the straight path. He doesn't want us to go by the wayside. And so as we allow the tutor in our life, that'll keep us from tottering. It'll keep us where we can grow and learn, and we come into the conscious joy that if we're on the right path with the Lord, we're headed for that right goal, we're not feeling condemnation. We're not feeling strangled by it. We're feeling the joy of knowing we're in the right place, working toward the right thing. Shaul Paul said that he pressed on for the, the goal that was set before him. He had everything in mind. If you look at a runner who wins, He's not looking around. He's looking at that destination, and he's going for it with all he has. That's what the Lord is doing in this, bringing us to know and understand. And that's why in Proverbs 6.23, he says, The statute, the, the mitzvahs, the commandments, they're a lamp, light. The law, Torah, is a light. That's what we're told in Proverbs. And that makes us understand. It's a lamp unto our feet. It's a light unto our path. It's here to, to guide us, to bring us into the purity. As the Song of Solomon says in chapter 6 and verse 10, it's clear, it's pure, like the sun. And then we see the sun, S-O-N, the declaration of the glory of God. It all comes together. So the light that's imparted to others, the lightning of, of our condition, it will help us as we see we do have a fear of God in the reverential way, not in the I'm afraid of him, I'm going to draw back. That's what happened to the children of Israel when they were afraid to, to hear the voice of God. But the mediator stepped in, Moshe. Our mediator, Yeshua, steps in. So don't be afraid. Come and hear and learn. It's the revelation of God and what he does want of you so that you can be on the right path, lead the right life, and hit your goal in the end. And that's why telling Psalm 111, verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who follow or all those who do his commandments, they have a good understanding. Wow, the acceleration. You're graduating. You can go from, from elementary school to junior high now. <laughs> and that's God's intent. The judgments, the mishpatim that we have, they're truth. They're enduring. They're unchangeable. Even as our heavens go, unchangeable. Remember our psalm. We're seeing it as one whole thought here. They give us a moral foundation. And verse 9 of our Psalm 19 says, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. <laughs> the judgments of the Lord, the mishpatim, are true. They are righteous all together. And I keep saying, and I'm broken record, but wow, we've gone from, from this to this. <laughs> How else can I put it? The eternal will of God. It's perfect in its form. And the development of the law of Jehovah, the standard of the law that God was giving to the nation, is what he calls the perfect law. The perfect law, wait a minute, I heard that Jewish boy, we call him James in the Berachat Shabbat, it's really from the root Yaakov, so you can call him Yaakov and, and be right there. He says the perfect law is a law of liberty. Now, can anyone give me another word for liberty? Freedom. 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 So all of a sudden, even as we continue from the original into the British we're being told the law isn't condemnation and death. It's liberty. It's liberty. James chapter 1, verse 25, but one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, 
You don't just hear it. You've got to do it. You have to become an effectual doer. That man will be blessed in all he does. You want to be blessed? Get into his law. Look into that mirror that shows you the law of liberty. And look at the freedom. And, and Yaakov, James was referring to the gospel. He was referring to the law of Yeshua. He was referring to the love of Yeshua. He was referring to the declaration of the righteousness and salvation by none other than Messiah. That's what brings peace. That's what brings pardon. That's what brings all the promises of eternal life. They're free. You're not earning them, and you're not having to do something to keep them. They're free. And when you come into the one who is the truth, the Son is the truth, and the Son will set you free. And I'm not talking about that yellow blob. I'm talking about <laughs> the Son, the Son of God. Yochanan John 8, 36 declares that he know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We have perfect liberty in Messiah. We have freedom, that perfect law that has brought us into perfect liberty. And I'll sum it up now in one word. And I'm glad you're back to here because you're going to love it, Chris. That one word is love. 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 When Yeshua was asked to sum up the commandments, he summed them up, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. It's all summed up in love. Love. When we know that, we are redeemed from bondage. We're not under sin. We're free. We, are, we have liberty. We're empowered by the Spirit of God living in us to do His law. It's not even that we have to do it. We plug into Him and allow Him to do it in us. God intends that. He doesn't intend it to be a burden. And He gives us His own character. He gives us His Spirit. That blows me away. That the Spirit of God comes and lives inside of me to lead me into the liberty, the freedom, to have the gift of my salvation, to know that I'm going to hit my mark, I'm going to hit the goal, I'm going to heaven, and nothing on this earth is going to stop me. Oh, yeah. Nothing yeah. can take it from me. Yeah. Because He gave it to me freely. And He couches it in this law. These <coughs> that keep us accountable. Because you have to have accountability. If you're not accountable, you're not going to stay on track. I'm sorry, it's just the truth. If we didn't have laws on the freeways out there, the streets out there, can you imagine what it'd be like to drive? <laughs> if everybody got to do whatever they wanted? <laughs> when it's being obeyed. <laughs> but it, it's God's character. It's God. It's the way He lives. And who could be more free than God? Nothing ties God down. Nothing bounds Him. He's not held prisoner. And we, in Him, having His Spirit in us, now we see the fulfillment of the law. And that's Romans 13, 8. Owe no man anything except to love one another. For the one who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Another philosopher, again, I don't deal here often, but he's a Jewish Austra Austrian philosopher, and he wrote a book, Martin Buber by name, he wrote a book, I and Thou, that's what he's really known for, but he caught the gist of it. He said, what, what you must do is love your neighbors yourself. There's no one who knows your many faults better than you. <laughs> okay, but you love yourself anyway, and so you must love your neighbor, no matter how many faults you see in your neighbor. So instead of saying, I can't love that one because, you don't say that about yourself. I think you got something right there. And remember when I started this message, the three things that are great, faith and hope and love, this is how the greatest is love. Because it's above and it's limitless 
and it doesn't end. Moshe, after he wrote down, after he spoke to the people, they, they, he built an altar. He made 12 pillars on it, room for each of the tribes to come up with a sacrifice to be made. He took the blood from those sacrifices. He took half of it and poured it on the altar, and he, altar singular, and he took the other half. And after the people said, all that the Lord says, we will do. We will obey. Then he threw the blood on them. And you might think, well, what's that? That's a horrible act. But it wasn't because it's the blood that covers the sin. It's the blood that we know actually washes away the sin. And that was a foreshadowing. Remember how we see the prophetic in Psalm 19 pointing to Messiah? What is it all about Messiah? It's about the blood. It's about his sacrifice. It's about the heavens declaring the glory of our Messiah. And as we look at that, then we understand 2 Corinthians 3, verse 7. It says, but the ministry of death, that that was engaged in letters on stones, remember the law cannot save, that came with the glory so that the sons of Israel couldn't even look intently at the face of Moshe. When he got it from God, he lit up. Mm -hmm. And it's so much so they had to cover it. If that was that great and it fades away, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? For the ministry of the law, the condemnation is glory. How much more does the ministry of righteousness have glory? And what that's saying is that the law could not say, but the glory that it's pointing to, we see in its fulfillment that does say that that's what lasts forever. That's the radiance of God that we see in Messiah and we are to reflect His glory. That's because of His sacrifice, because He shed that blood, because He poured it out in love and He said, greater love has no man than this, that a person will lay down his life for his friends. That blood is a picture of love. It's not something awful is a picture of love. That's the love of God that won't let me go. And it's the love I don't want to let go of. That's the love, ahava. When you take ahava, the root is hav, but when you have that olive in front of it, it personalizes it. Hav is to give. So the picture of love in our Hebrew is to give. And then when you put the olive in front and you're saying, I give, now you're getting the level of love that is the Lord. The Lord said, I love you. I give you myself. I give you my blood in your place. And even as our parashah tells about how the slaves would be set free, how there'd be a time when they'd get that liberty again, he's saying, I'll cancel your debt forever. You won't have it just for a time. You will have it forever where you are a slave to sin. And if any one of us has learned how to, to live without sin, come teach us all. <laughs> but the Hebrew brings it out. The Greek also brings it out. Yeshua is on that cross, his blood being poured out. And the last thing he says is, Kala, it's the Hebrew word. Tetelestai is the Greek word. Finished. It is finished. And when he said that, he gave up his spirit. You see, nobody took his life. He gave it freely. When he cried that out, his blood had been poured out, his death a substitute for us. We see the soldier come and pierce his side and blood and water poured out. A sure sign of a broken heart. A sure sign of death. But in that, what do we see? Physical birth. Mamas, did you give birth without blood and water breaking? No. You know that. The water breaks, the baby's coming, and in the birth there is blood. It's gory to look at, but it's the most beautiful to see creation come out of that. 
and that physical birth, that breaking of water and of the blood to bring life into this world, and now see it in the spiritual birth. You have both here also. You have the breaking of the living waters of Messiah. The Ephesians 5.26 says, So he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. The word of God is symbolized by water that washes, that cleanses, that refreshes, that renews. And it's a symbol of coming into everlasting life. Because as the blood was given on the altar, God said, I've put my blood on the altar for you to have remission of your sins. That physical birth shows that spiritual birth. The waters were told, Yeshua says, and remember there, the word of God, he says, whoever drinks of the water, I give him. He never thirsts again. But the water I give him will spring up in him a fountain of water <coughs> springing into everlasting life. That's what's given living water, the blood atonement put on the altar in our stead, we see love. You couldn't see it better expressed and better lived out. Figuratively, heart, lip, the physical, the pump. People say it's the seat of our emotions. That's in their heart, out of the heart, man speaks. There's our thoughts, there's our will, but the new heart the Leil Chadash that God gives us, that new heart, that's a transformation of our whole inner nature. You're going to find out you're hungry for new things. You're going to find out that you have new passions and you have new desires because you've been birthed. You're a new creation. And this creation is in His image. And again, He takes His Spirit and He puts His Spirit in you. So now you have the law of the spirit of life. That's what our scriptures say. That's what sets you free from the law of sin and death. God gave a flesh heart. That heart needs to be tender to the word of God. But it's described many times as a stony heart in scripture. Many times God says, you know, I wanted, but they had a heart of stone. They were rebellious. They wouldn't listen. <clears throat> but God says, I'll give you a divine heart transplant. I'll give you this soft, new heart. When you accept the Lord, He comes into your heart. Now, we are talking figuratively, but I have to tell you, Amari was four years old. He was going to the doctor for his kindergarten physical. And the doctor took that stethoscope and put it to his heart. Now, Omari had just recently learned how much Jesus loved him and had opened his heart for Yeshua to come live in his heart. And when that doctor put the stethoscope to his heart to listen to his heart, do you hear Jesus in there? <laughs> he was so excited because the love of the Lord was in his heart. And if you have that love in your heart, then you're going to keep that law that says love your neighbors yourself. You will feed, you will clothe, you will help, you'll visit the sick, you'll see those in prison, and you'll express love to them. Because what are you doing? You're expressing the radiant image of Yeshua, that the heavens are declaring, and that the law is guiding us in to see the law of liberty that sets us free. What love? The greatest of these is love. Amen. Amen.